Good morning, mates. I come to you this morning with a, with a heavy heart. And doing this lesson this week, it, uh, it affected me. Uh, I couldn't hardly finish it. Uh, it was hard to put together. Because I have a heart for those who, who hate. And that's my question today. Did God say that it's okay to, to hate? It causes problems, I know that. Hate, hate is a position that we take on. It, we, we do it, we take it off on ourselves to do it. You know, we can hate for many reasons. We can hate because somebody's out doing us in a job or somebody just, you know, does, does things better than us. Or, uh, or they harm us. There's all kinds of reasons to hate. And that hate builds up. It, uh, it, it, it's a driving force behind the wickedness that we do to others. It causes us to plot and to think of how we can get revenge toward that, that hate or what they've done to us or, or somebody that, that, that even does good and and we see them getting the attention and we don't get any. See, even a child does this. And it's, it's, it's built into this flesh and that's what we must overcome. And that's why I grieve so much because I, I reflect upon my own life even, the things in, in my life and uh, it's, it, it's a sad situation all the way around. Hate drives us to revenge, that's all there is to it. It, it, it makes no room for compassion at all. Uh, that's why God tells us to not let the sun go down upon our wrath, upon our hate. You know, love is also uh, a position to take too. So there's always this battle that we have. Like hate, love calls for action also too. We, we have to, to force ourselves to, to love, and, uh, but we have to turn toward the Lord to get that power to do that. We can't do it on our own in this flesh. And uh, that takes us back to the born again experience. Matthew 5, 44 is, but I say to you, unto you, he says, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that, that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Not an easy task, is it? You know, we read about Cain and Abel in Genesis 4, and uh, Abel was a keeper of the sheep, and uh, Cain was a, a tiller of the ground. And uh, when it was time to make an offering to God, well, Cain brought the fruit forth and, uh, from the ground and offered it to the Lord, and Abel brought the firstlings of his flock and did the same. And uh, if you remember right now, the, this is the first sacrifice we've seen, or first offering to the Lord that we see in the Scripture. And, uh, but God did promise something in the garden that he would bring a Redeemer. And uh, we don't know how the sacrifices were supposed to go, no one knows. But we do know that he accepted Abel's, and because uh, Abel brought the firstling of his of his flock, and the Lord respected unto Abel and to his offering. So imagine it was an offering like slaying the the lamb for him, uh, just like they did in his sacrifices. And uh, but unto Cain he brought his offering, and it had no respect. God had no respect for it. In other words, Cain was very upset about it. Kind of some anger set in on him, probably. And you might even say hate set in toward his brother for some odd reason. Jealousy, you know, hate caused Cain to kill his, his brother Abel. And he let the sun go down upon his wrath, upon his anger. He just kept, it just kept festering in him until it wouldn't quit. God tried to warn him. 
God tried to warn Cain. Why are you angry? Why are, why are you so sad? If you do your offering right, it shall be accepted. And if not, sin lies at the door. He's warning him. Hate will conjure up evil deeds inside you. So we must resist hate in us. We must. Ephesians 4, verse 26 and 27. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down upon your wrath, nor give place to the devil. As God's children, we are, we are supposed to do more than simply feel love. We are to act upon it as well. Remember that battle. Sometimes we can overcome it, but it takes God's power to really withstand the treacherous darts of the devil. Yes, even God hates too. We know that. We see it in Scripture. But God controls His temper through His love and mercy and grace, and that's what He wants us to do. Proverbs 6, 16 through 19 tells us, it says, These things the Lord hates. Now, I'm going to name them off to you, but this isn't all of them. They're, they're an abomination to him, to him, he says. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that d devises wicked plans, just like Cain did. Feet that swift to, to run into evil, run to evil. A false witness uh, who speaks lies and one who sows discord among the brethren. God hates these things. And, and it's much more. God hates a lot of things. There are a lot of things that are an abomination to God that he lies, lays out for us because he gives man uh, a pathway to walk. He created us for that reason. And when we fall away from that, then we're falling away from God's guidelines, his rules, the blessings of God, actually. We turn ourselves back over to the world, to Satan's follies. And that's not what we want to do. Is it? God said in Leviticus 20, he said to keep, to keep his statues. Keep the things that he's commanded to through the word. And that goes for the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. Now there are some things in the Old Testament they just gone away with, but some things are not. The things that God laid down in the beginning. If we go outside of the guidelines that God has given us, that he designed for us, and there are many of them. We pay a heavy price, such as man lays with man, marriage, or a, uh, what they call sex out of wedlock, uh, and a lot of other things that are lined up in there. We see all the, the statues in the Old Testament in Leviticus 20. Go and read it and see. And it gives us power to, to overcome. Jesus paid that price to free us, you know and to give us the power to override it, to overcome it. Will we be doers of his word or just hear it and forget it? Which are you going to do? First John 3, starting in verse 4. Whosoever commits sin also commits lawlessness. And sin is lawlessness. And you know that he has manifested he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. That's in Jesus. So whoever abides in him does not sin. Will you abide in Jesus? Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Such little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous just as Jesus is righteous. But as we go on down and read in verse 8, he who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of Man, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. So whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, 
and he cannot sin because he was born or had been born of God. Now, that sounds really strange because we see sin, we see Christian sin. Is it easy to make a mistake? Yeah, it seems like the flesh wants to rear up its ugly head once in a while and we sin. Is there forgiveness for, for us? Yes, there is forgiveness. But to habitually sin and to know that you're sinning and you do it anyway, it's a different story. When you know not to do something and you do it, that's literally pushing God out of the way. I'm better than you, God. I can do it anyway. You'll forgive me, won't you? That's the attitude we take. God hates that. Anyway, and as the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest, whoever, and that means whosoever, that means any of us, does not practice righteousness, is not of God. Nor is he who does not love his brother. Not of God. Very strong word. Now you know why my heart aches, because it hits all of us. Revelations 2, verse 6, tells us that Jesus hated. He hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Nicolaitans, I think that's how you pronounce it. Jesus hates sin. And he does get angry. In John 2.15, he, he talks about when he had made a whip of cords and, and he drove them out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and told them to get out and poured out the changers' money and overturned the tables. God no longer resides in that temple, that temple building in that yard where he was. He makes his abode in us now, those who love him. And he expects our temple to stay clean. So we must not get angry, should we? But we must get angry about something. What would that be? God gets angry. Jesus got angry. It must be that we must get angry about the sin that's in us. We must get it out. We must overturn the, the tables in us and tell it to get out. Just as Jesus did in his Father's house, he will do in our house here. John 12 tells us that if anyone serves me, he says, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will also be. If anyone serves me, my father will honor him. In John 14, 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them. It is he who loves me. Simple enough. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. Then for sure you'll know you're saved. you know for a fact who you are in Christ. So many people do not have the confirmation in their, in their walk with the Lord. And they tend to doubt in so many areas where God wants them to do what He wants them to do. But they just, they back away. And that's not good. We don't want to back away. We want to do what God asked us to do. Right? We all try our best. And yes, we, we stumble. But we don't fall. 
because God's there to help us if we turn to him and ask him for help. He is the one who gives us the ability, but we must ask him. Because see, we're still a free will agent to do what we want. So will you serve the Lord today with a whole heart? Or will you just straddle that fence and I'll do what I want when I want? Well, you know God doesn't like that. Now you see why my heart again is burdened. Because so many of us do it. I'm not exempt. But I will repent. Will you? Take care this week. Pray to the Lord. Ask His forgiveness. And He will forgive you if you actually mean it. And you turn from that sin. Not to go back. Don't look back. Take care. See you next week.